Hello everyone, this is a free Russia Forum channel. This is Global State of Affairs with Gary Kasparov, the 13th World Chess Champion and co-founder of Free Russia Forum. Friday, this is his day. Hello, Gary. Hello. Recently, the European Parliament issued a resolution calling Russia a sponsor of terrorism and a similar decision was made by the Parliament of the Netherlands and this is quite a new decision for European countries and more and more they say that Russia is a terrorist state or a terrorist regime then there is a question are there going to be any practical consequences of that and if they will be then which ones Yes, some consequences will be. We can't say exactly what forms of further isolation of Russia will be. Yet clearly they wouldn't be saying these words in vain. Quite indicative uh, that uh, America is not ready to recognize Russia as sponsor of terrorism because if they make this decision it will automatically mean that it will have to undertake special measures against this state and against those who are uh, helping this state to do terrorist acts. I think that there is a, a legal ground for this and uh, we shouldn't doubt that uh, there will be consequences, and these words are not inane. More often they say, what about those who buy resources from uh, Putin's regime? Are they going to be called sponsors of terrorism as well? I think this is a reason why Americans are so hesitant. Because uh, cause and effect in the United States is quite strict. If it's a terrorist state, then it is in the list of political outcasts. And the state is not an entity of international law for Americans, like Iran, for example. Yet uh, the direct negotiations and trade is impossible for such a state in the United States. And I think that right now Americans don't know how to act if this decision is made and they'll have to automatically introduce restrictions against such a state which will not allow them to have direct negotiations and to have any trade relations with this country. I think that in Europe they don't have such strict legal obligations, but I think they will have, because Europe is moving towards this direction, is going slower than we want them to, but uh, we wouldn't imagine that Europe would go such a long way from uh, total denial of any threat of Putin's regime, not wanting to introduce any preventive measures that would, if not stop, but at least make Putin behave and this is what we've been encountering for many years with Europe. Even on the 24th of February, this position of Europe was not ser seriously revised. And right now we can say Europe is making quite great strides uh, towards total boycott of Russia. At the same time, the European Union is preparing a new package of sanctions against Russia. We are working to make it as painful as possible for Russia and undermine Russia's capability in fighting in this war. This is what Ursula von der Leyen said. And the main thing in this package is the issue of restricting prices on Russian oil. Is it really that painful for Russia? I try to reserve my judgments in the areas where I don't feel confident enough.
Because selling energy resources, especially when we deal with oil, it's quite a complicated process and I don't uh, think that we understand consequences of either measure. I've read a lot of critical comments on this initiative of Europe and I can't say how right these critics are when they say th these measures will not will not be as effective. I would say that any restrictions, I'm not talking about the price cap on oil and other resources. I'm talking about any restrictions against the backdrop of Russia's isolation. Putin's Russia seems to be in this circle. In even uh, the allies of Russia on the Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, they, they don't support Russia. If even there are some effective ways to go around these restrictions, uh, they require new decisions on the uh, uh, Russia's side. Clearly, there are other markets and the oil will be bought. But such restrictions make things more complicated. They will buy Russia's oil, but potentially there are measures against those tankers that transport oil. This restriction help to narrow the room for maneuver for Russia. If even they don't meet our expectations fully, we can see that the sanctions that were already introduced, they significantly influence Russia in terms of how to fight in this war, and they restrict Russia's economy, not allowing Russia to satisfy Russian people's needs. If you could give an advice to European agencies, government, so what other measures should be introduced? In fact, I think that the energy should be channeled not to the new sanctions, but to make old sanctions work. So far, there are many loopholes. Clearly, there were less of them. We saw that the missiles that they launch at Ukraine, we can see there are chips and some electronics in those missiles that were imported by Russia, so which means that Russia can operate still. So that would be great to close this loophole. Uh, then the second one, it it is to have a more decisive policy in terms of confiscating assets of Russia. It's not to freeze them, it's really to confiscate them. So if we freeze, we just wait. But I'm saying to move in this direction more dynamically. Right now, in Europe, they're looking at different options how properties can be confiscated using genocide and war crimes as a legal ground for such actions. Besides, there are many oligarchs and rich Russians who are in sanctions lists and they have a lot of property and so far nobody really did the inventory of them and to channel this money to Ukraine. I think this process should be optimized and sped up. I think there is a lot of potential in this to get resources for Ukraine to survive in this winter.
Some critics of these measures, they say that these measures against the financial and political elite of Russia deprive this elite of different options, an option to retreat. They just consolidate around Putin. And this allows Putin to unite this elite. Do you have anything to respond to it? Yes, I can respond. I think that we need to stop thinking about the ability to do anything. This cowardice impotence are incapable of anything. For nine months the war is going, they understand that the war is lost and there is no any sign that there can be a mutiny among them. The regime in Russia is terrorist and fascist and it will collapse after the military defeat of this regime. That's why we shouldn't be thinking about that we need to find some ways to support those potential supporters that cannot do uh, anything within the regime now. So if they reach people, they had an opportunity and probably have now this opportunity. They need to leave the country, sell what they have. They need to pay something to Ukraine, buy a pardon for themselves. So don't tell us that there is a hidden opposition within the regime and if we are going to be too strict with them, they'll consolidate around Putin. They're consolidated anyway. Maybe I missed something, but I don't see any sign on the horizon that there can be a, a mutiny among them. A mutiny is possible when a defeated army comes back home, when they have refugees, when economy is in shatters, and when it's clear for the overwhelming majority of Russians that they cannot live on like this. And then there will be events in Russia. Not earlier and the confiscation of assets of uh, these rich people and giving them to Ukraine I don't think these actions can influence the readiness of elites to join people's revolution, if the revolution will be. They will join anyway, no matter if the assets are confiscated or not. They're not going to be heading anything. You don't believe in a coup d'etat. No, I don't. I simply cannot imagine this, because more or less I know the caliber of people that surround Putin, those who remember Stalin's time, no matter what we say about Beria, the head of secret police and his cohort, uh, they were of different type than those who are shaking today when Putin is looking at them and when he is sitting 15 meters away from them at this long table. Just remember the meeting of the Security Council right before the beginning of the war. Can we seriously think that these people are capable of anything? Maybe out of horrible fear they may do something. I think Putin knows how to deal with this. He's been in power for 22 years. And we need to understand that he wouldn't stay so long in power if he didn't understand the nature of his so-called cronies. Yes, I think this negative selection actually uh, raised a certain breed of people and they just physically can't risk their life and remove their leader. But hell with them. There are things more important. They keep bombing Ukraine, and Ukraine doesn't have electricity, and Ukraine is facing real humanitarian disaster, and Jens Stoltenberg is saying that they will be helping Ukraine. They will not stop support of Ukraine. Do you understand how they're going to do that in these new circumstances? In general, we do have understanding of this. However, everything uh, has to do with the United States and uh, obvious unwillingness of uh, Biden's administration to provide Ukraine with weapons right now. I think the war would be coming to an end if the Americans had stopped this lamenting about escalation and they stop negotiating with Patrushev and other Russian officials and they would be providing Ukraine with weapons that would help Ukraine to finish the war. First of all, this is tanks and until they have American tanks, uh, nothing can happen. And uh, Germany kind of found an interesting way of saying this, so they, they'll give tanks only after America gives tanks to Ukraine.
missiles of long range that can reach all bases of Russia on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, this is the 300 kilometers range missiles, F-16s, jet fighters, and these planes are needed to cover the sky, American drones. There is a whole list of different types of military equipment that would help radically change the situation in the front. And it, the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians would be able to destroy uh, key points of Russian military on their territory. So here we're dealing with terrorism, and even comparing to with terrorism from Hamas and Hezbollah, these terrorists, they don't even cover their strikes and they, that they hit uh, civil infrastructure. They, they would... Islamic terrorists, they would say, so we were hitting military sites. But here, Russians, uh, they're saying that they're trying to push Russia into the cave age in a total collapse. And Russian missiles are aiming at uh, civil infrastructure only. And under these conditions, all this talks about possible escalation if Ukraine responds to that. I think it's immoral, and from the point of view of geopolitics, they're absolutely unreasonable and short-sighted because they prolong the war and they don't help to finish it. Bases from which Russia hits Russia, they're not only in territory of Ukraine, but on, in Russian territory and Belarus territory. In my view, and that statement that Forum of Free Russia and uh, European Belarus society made, uh, we signed this statement, turning to the West and saying that Ukraine has to get these weapons and so that Ukraine could save its infrastructure and its people. Technically, it's all possible. Uh, all these ba Russian bases are not far away, it's 300... Uh, kilometers range missiles, they can reach that. It's really a technical matter. And here we get to the main issue, what holds Americans back. And it's not the risk of nuclear weapons. I think we passed that station. And it's useless even to talk about. I think that Narishkin and Patrushev on the Russian side, uh, so they were explained what would be consequences if they use the nuclear weapons. And Russian generals, uh, they wouldn't hesitate and they would never push the button because they understand that the uh, strike of American Tomahawk will uh, finish their worthless life. The problem is the defeat, military defeat of Putin's regime and uh, Russia will be in chaos. And I keep repeating it. And this is the idea that came to us from uh, 1990s when Americans were so afraid of collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think that today the same thing is the stumbling block because they're thinking what's going to happen. So if Russia falls apart, uh, China will be stronger. So nuclear weapons in, in whose hands these nuclear weapons will be. So this uncertainty, uncertainty of these scenarios is holding America back to provide Ukraine with the weapons that will help Ukraine to finish the war as soon as possible. In Europe there is a discussion. They discuss a possibility to provide Ukraine with Patriot air defense systems. Do you think they will give it to Ukraine? They must. Will they? I'm not sure. Let's look at this situation with the missile that fell in Poland. And I spoke about it on Ukrainian TV. 
I'm not a military expert. I'm just trying to analyze the information that we can find in the open sources and uh, rely on common sense. An official version of the West that, again, it's important to note that Americans articulated for Poland, because even before Poland said anything, Americans said that, yes, uh, this is a Ukrainian air defense system missiles that uh, deviated and uh, fell on the Polish territory. So, but Russia is still guilty. So everybody was uh, satisfied with this, because if it was a Russian missile in the Polish sky, then Americans had to bring their all air defense systems on the Polish-Ukrainian border to protect territory of NATO, as Biden used to say, every inch should be protected. It wasn't just an inch, it was six kilometers in the NATO territory. So, and again, let's look at what, what does it mean that uh, Ukrainian missile could have deviated from its trajectory. So, Russian uh, missile flew somewhere there and Ukrainian as well. I think it was S-300 complex. So, the first announcement was about two missiles and then it turns out just Ukrainians. There is only one logical explanation. The Russian missile was flying to Poland and was followed by the Ukrainian one. The Ukrainian missile did not deviate from its course because it was following the heat signature of the Russian one. And again, I repeat that I might be in the territory where I'm not competent enough. Nevertheless, I would like to hear a refutation of uh, this version that, in my view, is the only log logical one. The Russian missile flies to Polish territory, followed by the Ukrainian missile. The Ukrainian missile strikes it, and uh, as a result, Polish citizens die. And the position of the West, particularly Americans, was to play it low and the Polish and the Ukrainians, they had to play low too. Maybe I'm wrong, and I wish I'm, I'm wrong. But it's another indicator which tells us that Americans are not ready for decisive actions. They might deploy patriot systems on the border. Will they give them to Ukraine? I don't know. According to what the Minister of Defense of Germany said, I would say that this matter is not closed. The answer was a bit dubious, which keeps the door open. And it's a good sign, because they were saying that patriots are to protect NATO territory. But it doesn't mean that they cannot deliver them to Ukraine which means they, they're talking about it. On the other hand, I don't want to be uh, exceedingly critical because the factor of American support, Western support, is the key for the victory of Ukraine and the key for collapse of Putin's regime. So therefore their fears, if even their groundless fears, uh, it's not their fault, it's our fault what's going on. That's why it would be wrong to put all everything on them. But it would be great if the process of uh, uh, shipping military equipment to Ukraine would be adequate to what's going on there. And actually, Patriot, and not only Israel, uh, has one of the uh, most sophisticated air defense systems and they were successfully fighting uh, Iranian drones and Hamas rockets. And also we understand that uh, we don't have the critical mass yet so that Ukraine would get all the weapons they need. But looking at the unbendable determination of Ukraine and Zelensky's administration, and they're ready to continue the war, I would say that these horrible acts of terror will not bring Russia any gains. One thing, they kill a lot of people, and the responsibility is on all citizens of Russia, and these war crimes 
make it quite problematic for Russia to return to the civilized uh, family of nations. It's on all of us, and uh, all these things make people in Russia more and more embittered. There are people in Russia who are against the war, but right now all citizens of Russia look kind of the same for the rest of the world, not only Ukrainians, for Ukrainians. Russians are the people who don't want to resist terrorism and many of us who live in immigration for many years we do everything we can to break the Putin's regime. About the family of civilized nations uh, in Verkhovna Rada, Ukrainian parliament, uh, uh, they raise the issue of excluding Russia from the Security Council of the UN. So how important this is? If we're talking about legal mechanisms, they don't exist. Russia is one of the organizers of the UN, I mean the Soviet Union. And there is a little catch here, because Russia was a legal successor of the Soviet Union. So therefore, uh, they can start debating it. And we shouldn't forget that uh, Ukraine and Belarus uh, were equal members of the UN. Ukraine was part of the UN at the very beginning. And Stalin needed to have more votes there. And the Soviet Union, then Russia, by default, they became part of the Security Council with the right of veto. And Russia can freeze any decision, both the Security Council and the General Assembly. I think it is time to ask a question about the UN, what kind of organi organization this is. Uh, did we hear a lot from the UN uh, in terms of what's going on in the Ukraine? Where is this organization? Yes, they made some decisions, but clearly in its today's form, I think it lost its practical meaning. Since 1945 to 1991, uh, the task of the UN was to freeze conflicts. So they were chatting there and all the confronting members, uh, they were talking about this, like during the Cuban crisis. The Soviet Union said something, the Americans said something, So, and the UN uh, was managing more or less okay. Uh, there was no use of it, of course. Uh, they were passing uh, resolutions of different kind, like uh, one of those in 1975, Zionism, like Nazism, something like that. So, but at least it had some practical meaning to prevent open conflict of two blocks. What this organization has been doing since 1991, I don't understand, uh, because uh, there is no this uh, threat anymore, the blocks don't exist anymore. And I think it's time to uh, found a new organization that will be solving conflicts, not freezing the conflicts. And I think here we are facing a dilemma because the organization that was supposed to freeze conflicts and to chat, for some reason people hope that this organization can resolve conflicts. And it can't resolve anything, and we actually now are convinced it can't. I would suggest that we should move headquarters of the UN from New York to, say, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, and let's see how many diplomats uh, would like to live in Abuja. Let them discuss things there. If they want to talk, so go to Abuja and uh, have your debates there. I think it would be a right decision uh, to determine U UN's place in today's world, because when it's in, the, in New York, it gives it extra weight that it doesn't deserve, because such states as terrorist states like Putin's Russia, they have a veto right in Security Council. Just imagine Hitler has a veto right in League of Nations. Germany left the League of Nations in 1933. There was some element of honesty there, so they didn't have to do anything with the League of Nations. But today we have a situation when Putin's envoy in New York, in the UN, he is just lecturing 
other member states about how Russia's rights are infringed and, and he's proud of the acts of terror that Russia commits daily in Ukraine. And by the way, about New York and the United States, China was surprised by the scale of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One of the uh, British uh, news outlets uh, tells us, and the United States refused to provide Ukraine with uh, Polish jet fighters. And I think uh, it's uh, kind of within the same framework of the issue that we discussed earlier. But what they say that China did not expect such a scale of invasion of Ukraine and that China is not happy with this invasion. And right now it is somehow trying to make Putin behave. Can we say that the West managed to pull China on its side? China is unhappy because Putin is losing the war. He started the war and he's losing it. For dictators, it's the main indicator. If Putin was successful, took over Kyiv, liquidated Ukraine as a state, split it, and was talking to the West uh, from a position of power, then China would be getting ready to annex Taiwan. But Putin is losing, and is bad, because it creates a new situation. Dictators across the world, they are very sensitive to what's going on, like a weather vane to wind. So Ukraine is already given this wind, like look what's happening in Iran. They have these riots and they're spontaneous, these riots. And it has to do with the failure of Putin's regime and future defeat. And all this creates a new political situation. And of course, China doesn't want to see a total defeat of Russia. But there are still some prospects for China. They can profit by some Russian territories in the Far East and the Eastern Siberia. But there is also a prospect that some pro-Western government may come in power in Russia. In this situation, Russia, instead of being partner of China, it might become a potential partner of the free world. And this shift of a big geopolitical object might create big problems for China. And China has a lot of issues. Chinese economy is in a very difficult situation. They have those lockdowns. Xi Jinping decided to annex Taiwan and it's already in, in the policy. During his next term he has to do something with it. He will stay in power obviously endlessly, but there's still a term that is written in their constitution, I think it's six years. So during this time he has to decide how China will find a way out of this crisis. He has to find a new model of interacting with main markets. Uh, he has to resolve the issue of domestic demand and resolve the issue with Taiwan. That's why he is looking for uh, different compromises. And of course, for him, it would be ideal to exchange Putin for Taiwan, but Biden cannot do that. But in Xi Jinping's view, uh, this type of haggling is quite possible. That's why China is unhappy and the situation is uncertain and instead of getting another trump card for the union of dictators, they see a collapse of this community of dictatorships on the horizon, because he, this, Xi Jinping understands that this is a principle of d domino. How Tiananmen Square happened, and that was exactly it. And in China there are lots of these inflammable elements. Chinese economy 
is struggling and they can't uh, grow in extensively and so that's why China is unhappy and they're looking for for a way to keep their list of options without being involved in the conflict. That's why China is not going to give any support to Russia in this conflict. And China has everything, shells, missiles, rockets. Why? Because they're trying to state their neutrality and China never recognized annexation of Crimea and with all the statements they made and no matter how ambiguous they were, China supports territorial integrity of Ukraine. What they mean by that nobody knows, but at the same time recognition that Putin ex was expecting so much, it never happened. Uh, well, China, since the time of uh, rivalry between uh, Stalin and Mao Zedong, we know that China is ready to jump from the back and get everything they can from Russia. Recently, Xi Jinping and Biden, uh, they decisively condemned the possibility of using nuclear weapons. Can we say that Xi Jinping kind of rebuked Putin and uh, prohibited him from doing this? I don't know if he prohibited uh, Putin from doing it, but uh, China doesn't want to have this factor of uncertainty because use of nuclear weapons creates a new situation and uh, in this situation Americans will have dominance. China doesn't have a plan in this radical scenario. China is not satisfied with this, so what's going to happen? For example, they use tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, Americans responded and they destroyed all uh, Black Sea fleet or it's, they may move to nuclear Armageddon, which nobody is ready for, neither Russia nor the United States. Uh, when the stakes are raised, China doesn't want that. And Xi Jinping kind of stated that their interests are similar to American interests. They want to keep different options. They don't want to take sides. They have their own plans. And the plan has to do with Ch Chinese economy and Taiwan. And they have a game with Americans to play, but they don't want to be a hostage of Putin's madness. It's quite interesting that everything that kind of uh, fits the old myth of the wise monkey that sits on the tree and watches how the wild animals are fighting. And China is kind of winning here, looking at what Russia does in Ukraine. Because it seems that China may take a significant chunk of Russia almost for free if uh, Putin loses. Yes, I think so. And I think that warms uh, Xi Jinping's heart. And don't forget that China today is uh, the only country that has uh, territorial claims in Russia. In, in Chinese maps, we can see uh, territories uh, that were annexed from Chinese Empire in, in Far East and in Eastern Siberia. So I would say there is uh, quite a lot of territories for China that they can claim. If they're not going to incorporate those territories, but they will dominate there, and they're already dominating in these territories, and it can become permanent. So that's why an issue of Russia's collapse is not a critical one for the Chinese. For them, principal matter is the threat that the collapse of Putin's regime will bring other forces into power that will help Russia to negotiate with the West and join the West, then it's going to create a completely different axis, so to speak, and the economic dominance in the Far East will be questioned for China. So that's why Xi Jinping is not in a rush to make some 
extreme decisions. But the fear that uh, Russia may turn around from confrontation with the West after the defeat in the Ukrainian war and begin to cooperate with the West and quite deeply. So this fear in China dictates Chinese policy. Aren't you afraid that if Russia gets uh, too weak, uh, then if uh, pro-Western forces don't come in power in Russia, uh, then Russia may turn into a satellite of China? This probability exists. And I have to say that it's one of two probable scenarios. In fact, all the rare scenarios are just derivatives, so to speak, of these two. The first one, this is what we just said, this is transformation of Russia into a, a Chinese colony with raw materials and resources. And the other one is the attempt to integrate in the Atlantic communities. And Russia doesn't have any other way, just these two. I think the chances for Euro-Atlantic integrations are higher because for uh, many citizens of Russia, even for those who are indifferent about the war and are kind of silent supporters of uh, continuation of Putin's aggression, they wouldn't like Chinese option. That's why it can be uh, quite a contradicting situation in Russia, uh, democracy as a result of political default. Nobody can guarantee anything, of course, but this prospect of becoming a part of China may make Russian people look for an alternative, creating Russian state through confederation, not an empire, and to, to create such a state, such a confederation that could persuade the West that Russia is not a threat anymore and is a potential ally in the main conflict of the 21st century. I mean, the forces of the free world and forces of uh, the authoritarianism uh, that is headed by China. We also get some concerning news uh, that, on the one hand, uh, the war is kind of on pause, but at the same time, uh, we hear rumors about general mobilization of all Russian mobilization. Uh, we get some uh, information from Belarus uh, that they started mobilization there too. And today Putin uh, signed a decree that it will be one electronic database of conscripts, con contractors and all those who are in reserve. Can we suppose uh, that there will be an attempt of a big mobilization in Russia and there will be a new round of war in Ukraine. It's not that we can suppose that, we must suppose that, because knowing the algorithm uh, that regime acts on and knowing how these news appear and then denied and then everything happens, we should respond right away, for example, on the statement uh, to the statement of Peskov, who is trying to deny everything. At the point when Peskov, spokesperson of Putin, begins to deny everything, so we have to Take it very seriously, that's the direct indicator that they're getting ready for something. Because uh, Putin's regime has so-called credit history, it's a total lie, whatever they say. And when we hear how they deny some actions that are actually aligned with the logic of this regime, we must assume that it may happen in the immediate future. 
And I think it actually matches the general logic of everything that's going on. This meeting of Putin with the mothers, what kind of mothers they were, how long they stayed uh, in quarantine. So you see, these mothers were already identified. Uh, let me tell you what kind of mothers they were. Yes, right. As a, a Russian poet used to say, that, that is all lie. So it's, yeah, it's from there. The regime uses all resources to avoid defeat in the war, because they cannot win the war in that scale that they planned. They want to occupy what they have already, and they want to keep what they have, and they want to keep the corridor to Crimea. So the war will be going while he has resources, and he still has resources. Moreover, it's also clear that the resources are depleting, because the war is not only shooting at the battlefield, it's also the uh, contest of logistics, and Russia is losing this war. The Ukrainian army receives weapons, uh, Ukrainian army is more equipped, better equipped, and more ready for the winter. And we know that the West can provide them with all necessary equipment and clothes for the war, warm clothes, everything that is needed to survive in the harsh winter. And those in Russia who are saying we can repeat it, they forget that amount of land lease that helped the Soviet army to stand through the harsh winter during World War II. They received millions and millions of winter clothes, boots, everything that was warm for the soldiers to be able to be on the front line. Today Ukraine gets all this. That's why Putin has to hurry up. According to different evaluations, uh, military potential of Russia to continue the uh, combat actions, they have only six months, so within the next six months there should be a turning point. So let's put it this way, in the logic of Putin regime, when they cannot accept defeat in this war, it will be collapse of the regime, so they'll do everything in their power to stay in power. And this is mobilization, of course. On the other hand, mobilization means mobilization of everything, because they have to put the economy on this mobilized track, so to speak. And it's not quite clear how this uh, mafia regime will, will do it. Nevertheless, Putin is not concerned about it. He's kind of out of the zone of serious risk, and he will continue doing what he is doing. And it's kind of meaningless what he is doing, because he can't win in this war, but to demonstrate that Russia is ready to fight till the very end and to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of soldiers, it's a chance, as Putin thinks, to receive recognition of the West, recognition of his gains, and to increase pressure on Ukraine, because Ukraine depends on Western shipments. I think it's a miscal miscalculation. Nevertheless, this miscalculation is a foundation of all Putin's recent actions. I also think it's a miscalculation, miscal because I don't understand uh, how he's going to dress these mobilized people, and how he's going to equip them, and uh, what he's going to do with all of them, it looks like absurd, because we know that the majority of all losses incurred by the artillery, and modern analysts, uh, they uh, evaluate the cost of the war, and they say that uh, it cost Russia a quarter of uh, the state budget, and will be more and more expensive, according to American and British analysts, uh, the stock of Russian missiles 
running out and uh, if we're talking about uh, different missiles that Russia has and what Putin is going to be doing six months later we don't know and finishing uh, our stream I would like to ask this recently in State Duma uh, they approved a new list of enemies of Russia and organizations that are undesirable in Russia. And for the first time, we are in this list. I mean, the form of free Russia. Why do you think and what it tells us and what we are to expect from this? Any decision of the State Duma to extend the list of enemies, it's a logical act of a terrorist state that extends such a list and it's a normal process. It's surprising that we were not put on this list earlier and if I remember it correctly, uh, they mixed Lithuania and Latvia. So they don't know what's going on in other words. Well, naturally, we have to be in the list of uh, enemies of the Putin's regime. Uh, for many years uh, we were undermining this regime and we can proudly say we were probably the first ones who were consistently and persistently fighting uh, Putin's regime and exposing its nature. So I think it's a sign of uh, recognition of our fight against Putin's regime. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, we've been on air for almost an hour, so I understand that we have a time limit, so I suggest that we finish our stream. Thank you very much, and I would like to remind our audience that today we had Gary Kasparov in our stream in the program of Global State of Affairs. Uh, we do it every Friday. So please join us, don't forget about it, and watch Global State of Affairs with Gary Kasparov. I am Daniil Konstantinov in studio of Free Russia Forum. Thank you very much for watching us. Please like our stream before you finish watching the stream. Thank you very much.